First of all, if you're going to talk about a revolutionary situation, you have to have people who are physically able to wage revolution, who are physically able to organize and physically able to do all that is done. Women were definitely behind her. So she could take the lead, and the men saw the strength in her and followed her. Yeah, but the question is, Molly, how do you get there? Do you get there by confrontation, violence? Oh, is that the question you were asking? Yeah. Because if natural, because uh, the reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance is beautiful and it's pleasing to them. For so many, many years, we were told that only white people were beautiful. Only straight hair, light eyes, light skin was beautiful. And so black women would try everything they could, straighten their hair, lighten their skin, to look as much like white women. Because black people are aware, and white people are aware of it too, because white people now want uh, natural wigs. They want wigs like this. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> Often were fighting for a place, but the women themselves were so busy, I say, doing the work that they did not necessarily seek the recognition. And I had heard about all the discriminations and all the things that were happening to us in Birmingham, so I saw an opportunity that I needed to participate in the uh, demonstrations. Sounds of the African drum vibrating across the continent. Sounds of the African drum from Cape to Cairo through the African diaspora. Sounds of the African drum heard in every mountain and valley, reminding us of African warriors, reminding us of warrior queens Amina and Ya Asantewa. Sounds of the African drum reminding us of Ethiopia's Queen Regant, the Candaces and Makeda. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us of Queens, Mother Nande, Nefertiti, and Nzinga, reminding us of Queen Morimi. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us to remember our roots, reminding us not to forget our cultures, reminding us to hold on to our heritage, reminding us of our unique diversity. Sounds of the African drum, reminding us our strength lies in unity, reminding us of our proud history, reminding us to remember. Welcome to the 
first ride of the Black Madonna's Bila Kuda experience. My name is sister Camila Cotton, and I am excited to be able to share this new time with all of you. God is doing a new thing with our online ministry, with you and with me too. If you would go to your chat and rep your city, tell us where you're from, and please share this link with your family and friends so that they may join in on this virtual experience as well. Also, don't forget to like and comment your views. To learn more about whom we are, what we offer, and where you can join or serve, please go to www.shrineonline.org. Remember, God is doing a new thing within all of us so that we can change the Pan-African world community. I am an expression of God. I am one aspect of the grand divinity. I am cosmic energy. I am creative intelligence. I am one with God entirely, the creator of the entire universe. I am in God, and God is in me. I am the power of God unto salvation. I am the good shepherd, the divine light, and the abundant life. I am the essence of divine love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever, I shave and I am. I believe that human society stands under the judgment of one God, revealed to all and known by many names. God's creative power is visible in the mysteries of the universe and the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not long permit men to endure injustice nor to wear the shackles of bondage in the rage of the powerless when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus, the Black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black nation Israel to liberate African people from powerlessness and from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the Black Messiah is born anew in each generation and that Black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnant of God's chosen people in this day and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe, I believe, I believe that both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and program of the Black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church.
Get connected and stay connected online with the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Worship, join, learn, give, connect with us all in one place in just three easy steps. One, go to our landing page via our link to URL or QR code. Two, browse our selections and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Three, click on your choice and we'll take you right there. Yes, in just three easy steps, you can worship, join, learn, give, all in one place. So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Black Jeremiah 29, 11. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the second in the Bila Kuta Women's History Celebration. Today, I want to talk with you about what I think of as hashtag Sankofa Goals. That inspirational bird is a symbol of looking to the past, gathering from it that which will help us go forward and moving toward the future. She's not a bad lady carrying regret and even anger toward the future. You remember Erica Baidu's words, bad lady, you're gonna hurt your back. Dragging all them bags like that. I guess nobody ever told you that all you need to hold on to is you, is you. One day, all them bags gonna get in your way. One day, all those bags gonna get in your way. I said, one day, all those bags gonna get in your way. Hmm. The Sankofa bird is not nostalgic. In the 1600s, a German doctor combined two Greek words, nostos, meaning homecoming, and algos, meaning pain and distress. Originally, nostalgia was a medical diagnosis, and it could be that and a political diagnosis now. For those who so long for a utopian past that they would create a dystopian present, at least for those of us of color. They think, think about those who are wanting to make America great again and have handpicked aspects of the past which gave them such a sense of power and comfort that they would return women to forced birth, people of color to incarceral forms of slavery, stripping us once again, if we're convicted of a crime, from all of our civil rights in a society, the right to vote, the right to hold jobs, and the right to serve on juries. No, I want to think about the Sankofa bird. I want instead on this woman's history and Lenten Sunday to have a hashtag Sankofa goals. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot has pioneered a way of analysis of looking at individuals, groups, and institutions. She calls portraiture. It's a research paradigm or method that is explicitly, as she said, focused on goodness, on trying to document and understand what makes things, people, institutions, and relationships, and even concepts strong. What makes them resilient? What makes them endure, even when they're infused with imperfection and surrounded by difficult and impoverished circumstances? On our Lenten jury, in our journey rather, in our celebration of Women's History Month, we're in search of a goodness 
that which makes us strong and resilient, that which moves us toward thriving individually and collectively, that which moves us toward that hope and future promised in Jeremiah. Over four weeks, we've begun to look at women warriors, focusing how, on how collectives of African women under organizational banners acted to promote goodness, acting to build a stronger community. We look at them for more than a panoply of atta girls, isolated activities in which they engaged, but instead we want to cull from their triumphs, foibles, and pivots, how we can move as women, as individuals, as institutions, to compound their investment for the next generation. I was given the opportunity to reflect in portraiture about the National Cong Council of Negro Women. The goodness I offer from the council, as I'll call it, is its ability to pivot and to accommodate to a changing world. I cannot say it always pivoted easily, but it changed its focus over the years without such internal rancor as to destroy itself internally or harm its vision. Founded in 1935 by Mary McLeod Bethune, the council was a super organization. Mother Bethune was aware of the existence of thousands of women's auxiliaries, clubs, and other charitable organizations throughout the community. And each was able to raise, you know, maybe $10 to feed one family and pay for one book. She had struggled against the overt and subtle racism of the women's movement for suffrage and had decided that it wasn't for her. She was disinvited to the Great Suffrage March in 1913. On the other hand, internally, she had endured the ladies' auxiliary apartheid, the time at meetings of the great men where she was allotted five minutes or so to discuss the issues of women and children, but not to weigh in on the overall community. Undaunted, she perceived that the collective of those women's organizations would be much more powerful than the scattered groups. In its founding generations under Mother McLoon's, McLeod Bethune's leadership through that of Dorothea Height, the NCW Council focused on educational pursuits, supporting freedom schools and other educational endeavors. While Bethune was an advisor to presidents on Negro issues, as they were called, and a recruiter for women into the army in World War II, she stayed away from broader political issues publicly, even legal battles. Its conservatism was a weakness that separated the council from more progressive organizations of the day, but its fundraising and service model endured. When Mother Bethune stepped away in her last will and testament, she wrote, quote, I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. The world around us really belongs to youth, for youth will take over its future management. Our children must never lose their zeal for building a better world. They must not, must not be discouraged from aspiring toward greatness, for they are to be the leaders of tomorrow. Nor must they forget that the masses of our people are still underprivileged, ill-housed, impoverished, and victimized by discrimination. We have a powerful potential in our youth, she wrote, and we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that we may direct their power toward good ends. At its height, the council was estimated to encompass clubs with membership of four million. But the most dramatic pivot of the council, which guides much of its work today under Dr. Thelma Daly, occurred in 1968 when the council reached out of its service model and education into self-reliance and economics. Thelma Barnes, a popular black candidate in Mississippi who had served in the Greenville-based Delta Ministry for several years, lost a bid for Congress to a well-known segregationist in a 70% black district. The indomitable Fannie Lou Hamer approached Mrs. Hype, telling her how this could happen. It's written in Strategic Sisterhood, the history of the, of the council by author Toure. She reported that this encounter with Hammer had Hammer pointing out that some of our people had been threatened and others had been bribed away from voting with $20 promises or promises of new jobs. Hammer concluded, you see, Ms. Height, down here where we are, food is used as a political weapon. But if you have a pig in your backyard, if you've got some vegetables in your garden, you can feed yourself and your family and nobody can push you around." End of quote. And so began the pig bank, a real pig bank, where families were lent a pig, which they made it, 
and for which they paid with a piglet, which in turn was loaned to another family. Practical communalism. This self-reliance offered the council a bridge to the young radicals in SNCC, whose cry for black power was resonating through the community. Through that initiative, the council met a new generation of race women and young radicals like Frances Beale. You remember Ms. Beale. She was known for her writing on what is now called intersectionality back in 1968. She coined the phrase double and then triple jeopardy. She said, it is triple jeopardy to be black and poor and a woman. She cut her organizational teeth as a council staffer. The economic self-reliance work of the council morphed into international work with African women's groups, and that work continues to the day. The pivots have been many, and I doubt if Mrs. Bethune would recognize the organization under Dr. Daly, but it would have the same eyes. She would recognize its vision. And so it is with each of us and our stories. Just as our physical bodies have changed since infancy, so have we in many other ways. But usually, if we look at each version, inside and outside, we'll see the same eyes. Let me make this personal. A year ago, I walked out of the door of my office into a new phase of my life. I carried with me both the sense of liberation from the former phase and the sense of loss for the familiarity that that phase had provided. I also took about 30 boxes of stuff, papers and plaques, which represented both the liberation and the loss. And I promised myself that I would go through them and determine final disposition as each of them. Well, needless to say, as a year has come, I suffered a power outage, and I found myself in the home of those boxes because those boxes had heat and light, and I didn't have it in my house. And there were still 30 boxes. I opened one box la labeled miscellaneous, and I found pictures. I reached into that box, making it kind of a game with my eyes closed to see what pictures I would retrieve. I gathered several, but I remember three. One was of a 19-year-old of me. Another was the first time I brought my giggling seven-year-old daughter to court. And another was a five-year-old me clinging to my mother. I smiled. OK, maybe I had a tear or two. I know I had a mix of messages in my brain. I envied that five-year-old girl leaning on the safety of her protective mother. I longed for the innocent adoration of my happy child. And the trim waist and bold look on the face of that 19-year-old me took me aback and made me laugh and think, hmm, I got some things I'd like to tell her. I showed them to my husband, who liked the good guy he is, realizing that he had no idea the context of the pictures, indulgently said, good memories, babe, or something else equally vague, and he went back to his basketball game on his phone. I left those pictures in a stack with a marker in a folder, and I labeled them family personal. But the bottom line is, I left 29 unopened boxes, procrastinating, clinging to my round to it, as in, I'll get around to it. Now, I didn't fall into lake nostalgia, longing for a golden past when my life was near perfect. And I wasn't overcome with regret or anger. You know, that thing that says, I could have been a contender, but for that person, or that place, or that race that held me back. I did instead what most of us do. I noted those pictures and went back to the, to the day. I failed to examine what about those experiences provided some extra vitamin goodness, the resilience to go forward and hope toward a future. As a person, I was given the opportunity to note the changes from that protected kindergartner to that protective mother wielding a gavel. And I had a chance to look at that 19-year-old who bordered on absurd arrogance. Three iterations, each perfectly imperfect, all me. Until I began to work on this conversation with you, I wasted the Holy Spirit, the opportunity to reflect on my own story and to call from it the goodness the imperfect attributes, experiences, and relationships that served me well, and the behaviors, tendencies, and attitudes that impeded and could, if I let them go, impede my future, my hope. I leave you with this. We are gifted with the opportunity to reflect during Women's History Month and Lent on our stories collectively and individually, to journal, to converse with others, and to engage in portraiture. At each stage, our stories will see differences, personality, institutionalized, and otherwise. 
hashtag Sankofa goals. The strongest and best values that we can get from this is the lesson that in each generation, in each iteration, we have been given the opportunity to examine the goodness, to let go of the rest, and hashtag Sankofa, take it into the hope and the future promised to us in Jeremiah. Ashe. Shine bright, shine.